Welcome to The Planet Forward with Preetha, conversations for a greener future, the place where we ignite discussions and uncover innovations driving us towards sustainability. Every episode, join your host, Preetha, as we explore the stories, ideas, and pioneers making a real difference in our world. Get ready to be inspired, learn, and be a part of the change that propels us forward to a greener tomorrow. Welcome to Planet Forward with Preeta, conversations for a greener future, where we engage with visionaries who are shaping a more sustainable and equitable world through their groundbreaking work. Today, I'm privileged to have a guest whose global impact and dedication to environmental and indigenous rights advocacy have earned her international recognition. We are joined by Hindu Umaru Ibrahim, a distinguished environmental activist from Chad, who has dedicated her life to the intersection of indigenous wisdom, environmental con conservation, and global policy advocacy. Hindu's expansive roles include serving as an advisor for COP28 UAE, demonstrating her pivotal role in shaping international climate policy. As vice president at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, she works tirelessly to ensure Indigenous voices are not just heard, but are influential in global decision-making processes. A recognized SDGs advocate for the UN Secretary General, Hindu's efforts in promoting sustainable development goals highlight her commitment to a balanced and inclusive approach to addressing the world's most pressing challenges. Furthermore, as a senior fellow at Conservation International, she bridges traditional knowledge and modern conservation efforts, underscoring the vital role of indigenous communities in safeguarding our planet. Today, Hindu will share insights from her extensive experience, the challenges of integrating indigenous perspectives into global environmental policies, her vision for sustainable development, and the path forward in fight against climate change. Hindu, it's an honor to welcome you to Planet Forward podcast, and thank you for inspiring change across the globe. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time from your busy schedule to be here. And I'm sure your insights and experiences will greatly enrich our conversation and inspire our audience as well. So uh, I'm just going to dive in. The first question I have for you is around your background and motivation. Could you share the journey that led you to become such a passionate advocate for indigenous people and environmental sustainability? What personal experiences have shaped your perspective on climate change and conservation? Uh, thank you, Preta, and hi, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to be your guest today. Uh, so actually, I'm not passionate about indigenous peoples. I'm an indigenous. So when you are indigenous, you don't need to be passionate about your own right or your own so, role okay. that you have to play. So as an indigenous woman coming from a nomadic pastoralist community, my people live and depend from the nature. We depend from the rainfall. When the rain comes, we can get the grass, our cattle can eat, we can get the milk, we can get the meat, we can have our economy turning. And it is a way of living of centuries and centuries of years that my ancestors used to live. And then we live in harmony with the nature because we know that nature gives us and then we have to protect nature in the back. So we live in a circle. So for me, growing up in a changing weather, in a changing world where I'm seeing the rain become either heavier with the floods or not enough rain with the drought, mm -hmm. so it's normal that I just stand up for my people, for our survival and to protect our nature. So that's how I become like I have to fight for my own right to be survived, to keep my identity, to keep the place that I come from, to keep my community, my family. And then at the end of the day, I figure out it is not only my people who are struggling because we are living and depending from nature. It is all of the world where indigenous peoples are living. They always live and depend from the nature. And when the nature is getting harmed, so the indigenous rights are getting impacted. impacted. So then it's become a movement. Wow. 
I love the way you st- said, you started the conversation where you said, I don't need to be inspired by indigenous people. I am one among them. So you're make, making sure that your community is heard and your rights are also heard. So um, moving on to, so I think it's a great start. So moving on to your role and impact. So uh, as an advisor for COP28 UAE and the vice president of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, how do you bridge the gap between indigenous knowledge and global environment policies? I think when we talk about the global environment policies, most of the time, and actually more than 30 years of all these negotiations since the Rio uh, adopted all the convention on 1992, so it was always been, they call it expert, those who are coming from the offices, from the ministries who are sitting together and who are deciding about the future of our planet and how they can protect the environment. And then at the end of the day, it's become more political. Mm -hmm. Then it's become more interest and it's become like more threat. So then the life of people, the people like mine, all the indigenous peoples, we are not the commodity. We are the solutions. We are not the problem also. So we are the one who are living in this nature, protecting this nature. And when they just sit and take the decision without us, that is not working at all because they maybe might know what they're talking about when they talk about the policies, but they do not know what they're talking about when they talk about the environment. We are the people of environment. We are living from this environment, protecting this environment. So that make me actually starting also to be with my brothers and sisters, indigenous peoples around the world to attend the international conferences and to say, we have to be sitting in the table. We have to take the decision with you. You have to respect our rights. So we are not part of the stakeholders. We are, we are a right holders because we are protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity because we are protecting 25% of the land. Even we are only 5% of the world's populations. We are living in the savannas, in the desert, in the oceans, in glaciers. We are living in the mountain. We are living in the plain land. We are living around all the various ecosystems. We are the guardian of the high spot biodiversities. And that's why our land are the most fertile, are the most protected. So the basic thing is we sit together with you in these conferences we take the decisions the basic is you listen from us you implement what we are asking you if you wanted to plant the tree you cannot plant it in the office you have to go on the field and those who are living in the field and who are protecting and planting those trees are us so you cannot take those decisions without us so that was how i really like starting to advocate with all my brothers and sisters saying that enough we are a decision makers, we are leaders, and we must sit in the tables. So coming back to your uh, questions on being uh, advisor to the COP28 presidency, that have been very productive also because being inside and seeing what the decision are taking, how it's working is very helpful. So we ended up at the COP28 who have the most bigger participation of the indigenous peoples. You can go around all the corner of the COP28, uh, even it's the bigger COP, you can see an indigenous person somewhere. You go yes. to the room of the negotiation, you can see an indigenous person somewhere. So that means the participation have been more open. And then that's also mean because I fight it, I ask the COP presidency, you cannot talk about us without us. We must be presented. Then they supported us to participate. They supported us to accommodate uh, our uh, brothers and sisters who are attending from far. They supported on the visas. So then they supported to be participate in a various event that the COP presidency organized. Wonderful, very nice. So is there any particular accomplishment that you would like to share that you achieved in these roles, you feel that it significantly contributed in advancing the cause of indigenous people and the environment. Is there any particular achievement that you'd like to call for? 
I mean, uh, that's also what keeping me uh, moving because there are some of the little achievement here and there. I'm not satisfied about all the achievement because we is still are not taking the decision. We is still need to be sitting in the tables of the negotiation. But however, at the national level, uh, I get some achievement as we do have the indigenous people's knowledge indigenous rights are recognized in the national adaptation plan of my country chat we have the entire paragraph that is recognized that we are the solution we are not the problem and then we do have also the recognitions of an indigenous people's health system indigenous people's education specificity also at a national uh, legislations in chat and also with the creation of a specific directions at the local level, it was just a no far, just last year. So we worked with the community chiefs and then they give for the first time an indigenous woman land rights because wow. land is always to the man. So they never give the land to the woman because uh, even uh, traditionally or religions or whatever, the man who have to edit it in all. So when it's come to the com community land where the women are just like using it, so they are not having the right. So for the first time through the project that we work on it on 2D and 3D participatory mapping, community chiefs come to say like, we give this piece of the land to the woman. And then another community come like, I also give to the woman this piece, then another chief. So at the end of the day, since last year, we get like a woman land rights. And currently, wow. yesterday, I have my team on the field that is working with the woman to, uh, share the land that they have among themselves and we put the water so then they can do an agroecology based on their traditional knowledge so they can get some income they can create an adaptation measure they can create a resilience in their community and what they say wow. is they say we use this land to get some revenue to help our daughters to go to school so then they can also come back at the community to be the change so those national and local level led me also to work with indigenous peoples at the international level to get some recognitions so just the basic is, example is the paris agreement for the first time of the negotiation we get five references of indigenous peoples into the paris agreement That's significant that it is significant for us yes, that is significant. we get the recognition of our rights we get the recognition of our knowledge we get our participations and for the first time the UNFCCC who is the convention of the climate change make a body that is called the platform of the knowledge exchange of the indigenous peoples with the equal statute of the indigenous peoples and the member state so we have seven from member state seven from our seven social cultural regions Wonderful. not more so those are some of the recognition but of course we have little here like in sdg we have six references here there we do have some but still we have to take the decisions we have to sit in the driving seat we are the people of the nature so we must drive this agenda Wonderful. And I really like that you got, uh, you know, finally, the women had the right to own a land. That's a significant milestone, I would say. Um, so moving on to the next question, I think it's a perfect segue. So on con uh, conservation, international and environmental initiatives. Um, so as a senior fellow at Conservation uh, International, what pro projects are you currently involved in? How do they leverage indigenous wisdom of conservation efforts? Can you share a success story from your work? that highlights the impact of combining traditional knowledge with conservation science. So Conservation International have been the organization that started uh, since I was very young. I was among the first fellow that uh, joined the Conservation International to do an adaptation project. And it was one of my first documentary that I did at the community, wow. how the community are driving the adaptation. So that was like, 20 years ago, I can say. Oh my so, God. So, so then I joined Conservation International as senior fellow, senior advisor, and I am part of the board. So one of the big role is being the part of the board 
of the Conservation International. That means I can sit with everyone and design what the conservations should look like on involvement of indigenous peoples. Not involving indigenous peoples on taking the pictures, doing the video, but involving indigenous peoples into the implementations. Actual so, policy making as well. You guys have a voice. Policy making and implementations. Should I mean, both, both of yes. them. So one of the examples that I like more, it was in Kenya, that uh, uh, we have a conservation through the uh, uh, carbon market mechanism. So carbon market as indigenous peoples, we are a, most of us are against that because we don't want to our land to be a commodities. But these examples come from the communities who accept to do the carbon market for themselves. And okay. then they have a community forest. And then they start managing the forest themselves and getting paid for the management and conservation of their forests. So during COVID, so uh, most of the countries and then especially on the indigenous land around Kenya, there was like a big impact for the community. The only community who didn't get this impact and who was having the revenue and surviving was those community. They get like millions of dollars through the payment just because they are conserving their land. Not land. they are selling this land, they are conserving this land. And at the end of the day, they become a model that protecting their community out of the COVID crisis. So this is one of the examples that uh, I really like uh, see it is a best practices. The second is uh, the globally on the conservation internationals. So then the indigenous leaders who was member of this say we wanted to have our own center. We wanted to have an indigenous peoples division who can be managed by an indigenous person. And then there was the board here from that. And then there was a process that was created. And at the end of the day, the center is created and it's led by an indigenous leader. So it's going to be like an indigenous drive ideas, indigenous drive concept, and it's going to be implemented by indigenous peoples, not a tiered person, not an intermediaries. Then the uh, final example is like being part of the of the boards. So I'm seeing how like we are working to see the direct access finance to the indigenous peoples. Okay, how the indigenous wonderful. peoples can get really the revenue themselves and decide over the project that they want. So we are advocating to see the flexibility of funding because most of the fund have criteria that the indigenous organization cannot avoid. Like it's not possible. You cannot ask an indigenous woman who is on the field who didn't went to school to fill you like a big excel sheet to do the report of thousands of pages is not acceptable and then the funding are not flexible how this can work so we are working to see how the funding can be flexible can pay those women to continuously protect the environment and to have like a project or a, a community forest protections or an adaptation measure etc and in addition of all that the international policies and international negotiations that can involve the indigenous peoples wonderful wow that is a significant milestone that you've achieved and especially you told about that COVID story that speaks volume right uh, conservation actually helped them go through the pandemic versus the other way around the communities which you did not conserve their uh, forest. So I think that's a great message that you're saying that how environmental conservation is so important. So, uh, you know, um, I, I'd like to talk about the challenges and solutions. Like, what are some of the most significant challenges facing indigenous communities today in the fight against climate change? How do you approach creating solutions that are both culturally sensitive and environmentally effective? Yeah, that's a big question. So there are many, many challenges. So uh, one of the challenges that indigenous peoples have is uh, the right defenders, the violation of the human right defenders. So indigenous peoples stand everywhere to protect their land, to protect their communities, to protect the resources. And they are being harmed by the government, by the private sectors, by non-indigenous who are seeing them as a threat. Many indigenous peoples are getting killed from Latin America, Africa, Asia, all those countries 
on all those regions, indigenous peoples are being front line of climate change and getting killed because they are protecting only their land and resources. Just the last week, so there was in the south of Chad, some a big fight between the communities. And then just like the government come and tell to the indigenous communities that it is not your land, you have to leave. I saw the photos just in the social media. I get shocked. How you can just like use the people's get the revenue of what they are doing to turn the economy of the national level. And then when it come to the rights, you just like pull them out, say like you have to leave this land because you are nomadic, so you cannot get the right to land. So injustice among indig uh, to the indigenous communities is a lot around this world. When you take around the uh, uh, SAPMI, they are using their land to do the green economy to do the renewable energy in their land. land. Forgetting that they are using those land that are protecting all the glaciers and protecting their life, their livelihood. They are not getting involved. So indigenous peoples in developed or developing world are facing the injustice, facing the right violations, and the voice are not getting heard, and then people's getting killed. And this is like the big challenges that we are facing. And then another the challenge is at the international level, when you come to the negotiations, it's very easy to talk about indigenous people's knowledge because our knowledge are a value, but they don't want to talk about indigenous people's rights. So you cannot talk like about the positive things that you want and then forget about the things that you don't want to, to implement. So if you want to have the indigenous people's knowledge, you must respect the right of indigenous peoples. You must recognize the okay. indigenous communities. You must recognize the, their land and territories and resources because the knowledge are based on the place that they are living. So all those challenges, we are working through them every single day. Oh. Marginalization, discriminations. So it's still, people do not see us as solutions. They are seeing us as threat and we are not the threats. You the are the solution. Are the people who are creating the climate impact. The threats is the people who are really thinking about themselves egoistically. We are thinking collectively. We are yeah. thinking to everyone. Doesn't matter that people come from developed or developing world. Indigenous peoples are thinking about the protection of the planet, not of the individual, not of the region. We are thinking about the entire humanity. And that need to be looked at differently and that need to be recognized and respect. So the challenges are a lot, but uh, yeah, some, sometimes it's very painful. That's very, uh, very disheartening to see that, right? You're only, uh, for your knowledge, people respect you, but they don't want to uh, acknowledge the rights that you uh, have as well. So moving on to the future directions and aspirations, looking forward, what key changes do you hope to see in the global approach to environmental conservation and indigenous rights? What projects or initiatives are you most excited about in the near future? I think what I'm really wanted to see in the future conservation or environmental decisions is putting indigenous peoples in a driving seat. Indigenous peoples have to take the decision. We are not stakeholders, we are right holders. And if we are right holders, we must take the decisions. We know what's work for us. So even if they say, they call themselves, they are expert on protection of the forest or oceans or land, etc. We are seeing that every single year is become more hotter than the other one. Like 2023 is more hotter than 2022, yes. than 2021, etc. So if they are acting in the right direction, we cannot get the temperature increase. If they're acting in the right direction, we cannot see the devastations increase. We cannot see the oceans uh, is becoming more warm or the land degraded, etc., etc. So that means even they are acting, they are not acting fast enough or in the right direction. But indigenous peoples know how to protect their land. We know how to protect our resources. So we want to just to take the decisions. We want them to listen to us. 
We wanted them to go beyond the economic interests that they are looking, beyond the political interests that they are looking, beyond all the colonialism way that they are using to impose to the world the way that they are protecting the nature. So then we can really take the right decision on environment. We have less than 10 years. 20, yes, 2030. Yes, it's only six years. years. That's right. It's like nothing. And if we do not reduce it significantly now, we are going to be the generation that is turning the button of no reverse. We are seeing all the movies in the TVs that are showing the drama. It will become a reality. So maybe today we are the most impacted as indigenous peoples. But we are resilient and we are building our resilience. So it is the time that they learn from us, they let us take the decisions. And of course, when we talk also about the future on how we can do the renewable energy, how we can change the world green, greener, etc. As indigenous peoples, we say like, yes, this is exciting. We wanted to be part of it. But we cannot be part of it if you do not set a limit. What is the limit of extraction of all the mineral that we need for the renewable renewable energy? energy yes. What is the limit that we are putting to all the minerals that to all the just transition we are calling? What is the just transition mean for them? So we cannot recreate again the wheel of just extracting and then coming for the next years to another impact. All the minerals we need are in high spot biodiversity and all the high spot biodiversity are the land of indigenous peoples. Yes. So that must be respected, recognized. So we must think about what kind of future that we want. And we are there also to guide them what is the meaning of the just transition for indigenous peoples, putting the limit, putting the legislation who are rights and putting the equity between develop and developing war. When you just take the examples of electric car, mm -hmm. where they're talking about uh, uh, electric vehicle, they're talking about it in developed world again. They are the one who are setting all the, the all the needs that they want to have like by 20, 30, 100% a renewable vehicle. That's fantastic, yes. How about developing world? Where the community do not have even access to the clean water to drink. They cannot talk about the car at all. And they cannot talk about the electric car because they don't have even the light to turn on or off for the kids to read their lesson when they come back to school. So this injustice have to be part of the just transitions. The developing world must get the right to be developed, developed in a cleaner way. So it cannot be like an injustice that develop world can again take the positive things that they want and leave the developing world to be poor and poor. And then they say, we are coming back to give you the charity. It's not the charity. All the mineral that we need are in developing world. So it is the time that the equity and justice to be respect. So just transition is not only making the rich again more richer. Those who have technology to highlight their technology that we do not know if those technology are even sustainable or not. It is the time that to put the indigenous knowledge in the top and to respect the nature, to respect the dignity of the human being. So to your last questions on what I'm excited about it more, I'm excited of a couple of things, but particularly I'm excited of some initiatives. So when okay. you like Earth Shut Initiative, it is the initiative by Prince William that I'm part of the judges and I'm always getting excited when I'm reading to choose with my colleagues, the finalists and then the winners. Wonderful. So it is very exciting because you see the thousands of thousands of initiatives from indigenous peoples, from the small stakeholders, from all the uh, use, from the different kind of the technology, but science, but also the traditional knowledge. So then you say like, if we combine all those fantastic initiatives, it can give us all the solution that we want. So this is like my excitement always to see that we are innovating to protect the nature.
nature. And of course, I'm also excited to see all the young people around the world, even from developed world and developing world, standing up and starting to hold accountable the leaders, mm -hmm. hold accountable their governments and telling them it is our future, it is our present, so you cannot put us in this past way. So I have the hope and excitement that maybe those next generation, when they become a leader, maybe they cannot be an egoistic, to just think about themselves so they can think about the developing world, they can think about another use, they can think about the future of their kids, etc. So those are the excitement. And that's also what keep me going. But the most exciting for me, it's my people. Seeing my community who didn't went to school, and they are part of the community who do not have the light could never turn a button of on or off. And the of basic necessity life. is what the developed world have, has. Yes, who do not have clean water to drink, but who is still standing up for the environment, to protect the nature, fighting to protect all the little resources that they have, who is fertilizing the land, for protecting the ecosystem. Doesn't matter that they do not know the climate negotiation or environmental protection at the international level but they are always there in the rendezvous to be the actor, to be the solution maker. Sure, so this is very, very exciting for me. That is awesome. So um, this last question on this podcast I have for you is um, reflections on global environment policy. You said we only have like five years left for 2030. So in your view, how can international environmental policies better incorporate and prioritize indigenous rights and knowledge? What role do you believe in the upcoming COP28 conference should play, or it's already done, uh, play in addressing the unique challenges posing by climate change to indigenous people? The world needs a radical change. We need a radical change to reform what we are doing, to reform the way that we are acting. COP29 going to Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. And with all the geopolitics around the world, it's going to be very challenging for many to act. I really wanted that the world go beyond the geopolitics, beyond the egoistic way of thinking only around their own border, their own limit, to think about the planet as one doesn't matter that your limit is Europe, US, or whatever regions, but you have no limit as the wind have no passport to travel, as all the air that you need to breathe have no passport, doesn't matter your nationality. Then to think about COP29 must put the indigenous rights and indigenous knowledge in the middle, because we are the peoples who have no limit, who are not thinking about our borders, but who are thinking holistically about the various ecosystem that we are living on need. So I really wish that the world can be weak mm -hmm. about how indigenous wisdom is functioning and take the right decisions radically. This year, 2024, is very critical. It is the year also we are going to have the biodiversity COP, the desertification COP, the climate COP. So between Latin America, when the biodiversity will be uh, on Colombia, or the, uh, the climate that is going to be in uh, Eastern Europe, in Azerbaijan, or the desertification going to be in Middle East, in Saudi Arabia. So all those regions must work together. We cannot work in a silo into the different environmental conventions. They have to be work on a holistic way in a synergy. And that has to be from the UN reform. So UN must recognize that those three secretaries must collaborate. They, then the country member state who are the same member state to each convention must to come up with a coordinated agenda to do not say something different in biodiversity, another different in climate, another different in desertification, that cannot work. It is the same government. So they can have their agenda on all the reduction of the emission, protection of the environment, restoration of the land to come together, to have the same objectives. Then they must act, action, 
at the local level is needed now and than ever. Then we can say maybe by 2030, we can reach the objective that we want. But I'm afraid that they are so divided. This year going to be a big election year for all over the world. Yes. They are going to think more about who is going to win the power where, and then again, the power going over the decision of the planet. So I'm really afraid of that. So I really think doesn't matter who will come into the election, it's matter who will take the right decision. For the planet. Yeah, for the planet and the people. For the planet and the people. So thank you so much, Hindu. I don't know. Uh, I've learned so much just listening to you today. Um, so as we wrap up today's inspiring episode, I'd like to extend my deepest gratitude to Hindu Umaro Ibrahim for joining us and sharing her profound insights and experiences. Hindu, your dedication to environmental sustainability, indigenous rights, and global advocacy is not just commendable, it's a beacon of hope and a call to action for all of us. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in to Planet Forward with Preeta, Conversations for a Greener Future. I hope today's conversations with Hindu has ignited a spark within you to think deeply about our planet, to recognize the invaluable wisdom of indigenous communities, and to understand that each of us has a role to play in shaping a sustainable and equitable world. Let's carry forward the lessons learned today and commit to being more mindful of the choices we make and the impact we have on our environment and on each other. Together, inspired by leaders like Hindu, we can make a difference. For those looking to learn more about Hindu's work or to get involved, I encourage you to explore the initiatives we've discussed today. Let's all take a step, no matter how small, towards a future where humanity and nature thrive in harmony. Thank you once again, Hindu, for your incredible work and for sharing your journey with us. And to everyone listening, until next time, keep moving forward, keep making an impact. Thank you so much, Hindu. Thank you, Preta, and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for tuning in to the Planet Forward with Preetha, conversations for a greener future. Together, we're exploring the innovations and stories that inspire us to think and act for a sustainable world. If you're inspired by today's conversation and want to be part of this journey toward a greener future, make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. By subscribing, you'll never miss an episode filled with groundbreaking ideas and actionable solutions. Let's continue to make a difference, one episode at a time. I'm Preetha, reminding you to make every day count for our planet. Until next time, keep moving the planet forward.